Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, big data analytics for population analysis, which I think is a mouthful. Um, my name is Rahul Potluri, and I'm the founder of the ACOM study unit in Birmingham, United Kingdom. Um, just a few of my um, declaration of interests, and again. So another declaration of interest that I have is that I've recently moved to Canada, and um, you know how the North American accent is very catchy, and now that we're talking about big data, and now we're in magnificent Rome, and I'm sure you're all big data up, um, I just hope I make sense. If I don't, just shout out or you know, let me know. So um, a couple of weeks ago when I was making this presentation, I was in hope looking at YouTube to see if any of our illustrious th previous three speakers had uploaded their presentation. And I searched for big data analytics for population analysis. This was after going through the ESC website to look at the title for the presentation. And then it struck me that actually what we are talking about is there in front of our eyes. Um, so what was encouraging was that the first a couple of things about this slide. Isn't the first thing is the first two or three of the main results were about healthcare. And so big data analytics is catching on in healthcare. The second thing is towards the right, where it says booking.com. Google had already analyzed the fact that I was going to ESC and was giving me hotel options. This is the best way or example that I can tell in a practical sense of where big data analytics is being used. This is real-time use of big data, and this is what healthcare should aspire to. So I know we've had sort of an overload of big data, and for me, the definition of big data is computerization of information that was previously collected with paper and file in large warehouses. I know in some places we still do that. We still fill in reams and reams of notes. Um, but as the kilobyte changed into the megabyte and the uh, gigabyte and the terabyte, we, especially since the late 90s and the early uh, uh, and the turn of the millennium, we have been collecting more and more data. And whilst the first decade of the millennium um, was about data collection, the last decade, the, the current decade, is definitely about using this collected data and for uh, analytics purposes. And big data analytics is, you know, all around us. And I think that's something that we don't really appreciate. Um, it covers topics such as how we spend our money, how we shop, how we go on holiday. I'm sure many of us have clicked on the impulsive next holiday just as you've come back from the previous one, just because they know what you like. Um, and also, uh, it's always also around in healthcare and sort of the range of medical conditions we have. So all this data is recorded, analyzed, scrutinized to the minutest detail for information, profit, and advancing scientific and general knowledge. And in one way or another, we have all benefited from this, make no mistake. So one of the early exponents of this were uh, Tesco, which is a British retail stay, um, uh, chain. And uh, what they did was introduce this club card scheme, which they made you feel was sort of the, uh, they can, um, uh, you know, you can gain, shop more with them, and then you can gain points and earn money. But actually what they were doing was collecting information on everything you were shopping for and sending you offers in the post uh, about what you might buy next in the hope, and actually in practice you, do end, you did end up spending more money. So after Tesco, you had a whole range of cards coming out, and actually so many so that you don't actually, can't actually lose your wallet anymore. Another area that we fail to really understand as uh, medical um, people is the stock exchange. Stock exchange has been using big data for a number of years. And, you know, it often used to, uh, about a few years ago, I never really understood why the Dow Jones never went up and down in linear fashion. You know, you hear about sort of uh, stock exchange taking a big hit every day, um, but it, it often tends to be the case that three quarters of the day they're in, in positive and then they suddenly dip. And the reason that is happening is often the 
the trends, the, so the 30-day moving averages, the 60-day moving averages, the six-month, five-year, etc., are all triggered by a whole set of bots, which then decide to sell or buy stocks. And so the uh, stock exchanges go up and down, not based on what the market sentiment is, but more rather on sort of what is analyzed with all these data points. And that's something that we fail to recognize. And there's a lot of money, billions, being made or lost in this process. So what about in healthcare and medical research? Well, I think in this aspect, this has been, healthcare and medical research have been slow to implement big data. And the re one of the main reasons for that is that medicine and cardiology is a hard life. And we've become very focused in what we do whether it's stenting people or whether it's basic science research, and we fail to think outside the box and uh, sort of think about a multidimensional view of the world. Um, and yet the data around us, especially in healthcare, has been accumulating. And it's been accumulating predominantly because of these factors. The fact that our healthcare budgets are rising given a much um, aging Western populations, Given that we now face austerity uh, in a different proportion to previous, and the fact that every pound or every dollar that we spend uh, is actually accounted for and must be justified. And, this, uh, and there are a variety of uh, different tools that have enabled us to do this. So ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Diseases, which is most widely used at the moment, has been uh, is utilized to report diagnoses and disease codes uh, for uh, coding purposes. And as my previous speakers have alluded to, um, the development and uh, you know, the real development of um, health informatics. And medical billing, medical billing has widely benefited from this as well. So the problem with cardiology, and especially, well, this, this extends to pretty much most of the medical uh, fields, but it, particularly in cardiology, is that it's a very evidence-based speciality. And we base a majority of our practice on clinical trials. And clinical trials are becoming very expensive. There's much more regulation. Uh, they are often ending up costing billions of dollars. And the funding issues is, uh, are in the face of austerity are not clear. And also you have patent laws, which mean that companies have to make their profit within a certain amount of time. Um, and often you find that if you have X product, you have to sort of strategically market that so that you make maximum profit in that time. And now we have an era where we have thousands of medical journals, and I'm sure the majority of you sitting out there have a daily uh, email saying, can you please submit to this new journal? And yet, technological advancement or development of medical science, particularly in cardiology, is disappointing. Less expensive registry-based clinical trials are being implemented, and there's still the jury is out there with regards to that. And trials are being designed with less significant endpoints and shorter follow-up periods to lower the cost, which, you know, in some conditions, in cardiology, such as stable angina, the, the follow-up periods are very short and are not su sufficient for us to look at the outcome measures. And often the main problem with trials is that it's not really real life data uh, given the exclusion criteria and an aging population. So I think again this has been touched upon and large data sets in research are not new. Um, people often say to me we already have large data sets in cardiovascular research so why bother? I mean we've had Framingham for decades, we've had the Chad Stuvask uh, database, and we've got the NICOR data and the BSIS data and a number of Scandinavian registries, and also the Medi Medicare data from the US, and also a number of other databases from the EU. So what is the big deal? Well, the previous data sets that I have mentioned range from hundreds of patients to hundreds of thousands of patients. So that's, you know, that's a very, very large data set. But what about all that routinely collected healthcare data that I talked to about? The population of the UK is in excess of 60 million. The population of the Western world, where such routine information has been collected over the last decade, is over a billion. And over the developing world, which, is not, which actually is not too far behind in terms of data collection, uh, has populations numbering many billions. If we can utilize such routinely collected information, um, 
you know, it will really pale the existing cardiology data sets. And I think that's where the big data should uh, comes into it in terms of cardiovascular research. So a little bit about how we have tried to uh, use this. And uh, I have founded this uh, unit called ACOM, which stands for Algorithm for Comorbidities, Associations, Length of Stay, and Mortality. And it's a computer program and algorithm that I have devised, which uh, changes routinely available uh, anonymous healthcare data into a fully functional, cross-sectional, and longitudinal research database with real-life outcomes. Um, at the moment, we have 1.2 million patients, increasing to around 4 million in new patients by the end of this year. It includes multiple hospitals all over the UK. So what have we done? Well, we've undertaken a number of studies addressing poorly researched areas, uh, particularly such as me mental health and physical health and the interplay between them. So demographic inequalities in healthcare, which, is, which, are, fully, uh, which are poorly studied. Factors influencing outcomes such as mortality and length of hospital stay, uh, associations, interactions between diseases and conditions, hypothesis generating research, which can then be tested in basic science, and also health services research. We have in excess of 150 peer reviewed publications and international publications to uh, presentations to this date. So I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, a flavor of the sort of data, we, uh, the research that we have done. And this is a study that was uh, presented a couple of years ago in one of the ESC meetings where we presented that high cholesterol levels increase the risk of development of breast cancer. We followed the, that up uh, two years later, a few weeks ago, with uh, a study which showed that patients who were taking who had high cholesterol and so taking statins had much improved mortality uh, compared to the patients who didn't have high cholesterol over the 14-year period. And again, this was widely reported. Um, another uh, study that was widely reported in the media was that we showed at the British Cardiovascular Society this year that um, being married um, in when you have a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, improved your long-term survival by 14%. And, you know, I was thinking this study was just a bit of fun whilst it was reported in media. And last week, I was surprised to see that Dr. Stephen Nissen had written about it in the Cleveland Clinic Journal. So other health services research that we have done, is show, which were presented last year at ESC, were that we... Patients with acute coronary syndrome were more likely to die if they were admitted uh, at, to the hospital at the weekend. This was slightly controversial, but again, the data was clearly uh, ro robust. And also, similarly, another study that we have done was showing that all hospital patients have much worse mortality if they were sent home at the weekend. So clearly, big implications for uh, health services. We have done some clinical studies as well, and we have shown the role of percutaneous coronary intervention in specific disease groups that are poorly studied, so in octogenarians and also in patients who've had previous uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. Uh, at this ESC, we have seven abstracts that we're presenting, if any of you are interested, including a press conference on um, uh, showing that increasing readmissions to hospital with patients in heart failure actually worsens their mortality. So the reason I'm going through all of this is that data sets such as ACOM, which have been algamated, have potential to do something that have not been done before. And that's because of the number of patients and the power that such no in high numbers of patients gives. The time periods that we are talking about, so 15, 20 year time periods, is not realistically possible to go out and collect this data by paper and pen or even by computer. The other advantage with such data sets is that this is real world data. And whilst we talked about clinical trial data being um, having significant exclusion criteria, this is as real world as it gets and they are real world patients. So such data sets have the ability to revolutionize the way research is performed. And we all, you know, traditionally research was performed with uh, literature reviews, seeing what was out there, coming up with a hypothesis, and then testing out that hypothesis with a carefully planned study. Well, think about this. What about the, if the research question is not known until the data is analyzed? 
And what about the data inherently uh, contains things that we cannot think with a single mind? And that's where analytics and computers come into it. So where do we go from here? Well, complex modeling and further algorithms from the world of computing, mathematics, and statistics um, can enhance our knowledge and generate hypotheses that we do not, that we cannot come up with. And I think that is the next stage and next uh, development in this. Um, we br briefly heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning in medicine, and some of our work um, that we are undertaking at the moment is also uh, looking at heart failure, is looking at how and when patients develop heart failure and how we can analyze this data and use it in real time as the patient comes through the door in the hospital to improve their outcomes. Um, and machine learning you know, off offers an opportunity to identify concepts rather than just cl uh, clinical correlations, which is what we have been focused on so far. And it could become an invaluable data-aided decision-making tool which is, I think, the next step over the next 10 to 15 years with cautions. There are limitations, and the main li limitation as has been touched is the quality of the data collection. And, you know, there have been studies that have shown that the data is around 80 to 90% accurate nowadays, and is by no means 100%, but a number of validation studies are being done and have been done, which show that such data can be taken seriously. And given the millions of data that we're talking about, one argument that will be going forward over the next two, five to 10 years is the power of the data that we have in these data sets versus the accuracy. And whilst I'm biased standing here and talking to you about the power of the data, there'll be many skeptics out there about the accuracy. And I think this is a big argument and something that will need to be addressed in a systematic fashion as we go forward with big data. So I, I strongly believe big data analytics will delineate a paradigm shift in cardiovascular medicine. Utilizing such large data will allow us to study disease in populations like never before and allow us to enhance our disease, understanding of disease and outcomes, our Im improved clinical care by prediction of patient outcomes, um, come up with new ideas that can be then tested in the laboratory and then again in clinical trials and allow us to predict and disease patterns and interactions and also hand in hand with that allow us to uh, plan our healthcare resources and healthcare services in view of what has happened in the past to what might happen in the future. And this is very important uh, in a world of austerity that we are living in. Thank you.